But so what I wanted to do today was just take advantage of this opportunity to do a little peering into the future. Um, I spend my Mondays at a venture capital firm called More David Ventures, and I spend most of my time, historically I spend most of my time in the enterprise IT space. And I want to, uh, the enterprise IT space has been a little quiet in the past decade, and I, I don't think it's going to stay quiet. And I want to talk about where it's going, and in particular how it will relate to some of the policy issues that, that the innovation, uh, this innovation summit is, is dealing with around you know, the creation of jobs, creation of work, the whole American competitive advantage footprint in a changing world. And so the agenda is going to start with something that I, I think I know something about, which is the future of enterprise IT. And then I'm going to do some speculating about the future of work, which is speculation. But I'm Irish. and. We are good at speculation. That's one of our strongest, strongest strengths. So this is kind of where it's going to head. We'll talk a little bit about something called systems of record, meet systems of engagement, and this thing that some people are calling the consumerization of enterprise IT. I think it's a very big deal. And I want to tell you why I think it's a big deal. But I also want to think, talk about how it's going to reshape and how it is reshaping already the future of work and how the implications of that for where you invest in talent, how you, what does it mean to create employment in the United States in, the, in, the, in this century, because I don't think it means the same thing it meant in the last century. And I think some of the, some of the challenges of public policy is that we, we have residual mental models about how do you create a, a strong society around job creation that are wrong. And, and, and I think we've got to sort of adjust them in real time. So that, that's kind of where this thing is headed. Okay, enterprise IT, the current state, systems of record are largely complete. So systems of record are all the database systems that we spent you know, decade after decade after decade creating first for mainframes, then for mini computers, then for client server, then for internet enabled SaaS. And it started with financial systems and then it went to HR systems and then it went to order processing and inventory management and then it went to customer relationship management and supply chain management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we did it you know, all the way across and all the way down. And by, by the end of the decade, we had pretty much spent about a trillion dollars, maybe a little bit more. So there were data centers everywhere, and they were designed essentially to run transaction systems on behalf of large and then increasingly medium, and then eventually small, small businesses. It was all about online transaction processing. The relational database was the center of the universe. You talked about data. You talked about information. That was where everything converged. And the network was only a transport mechanism to get data from one place to another place. That, that was sort of the, the world of that world. And business intelligence was in, intended to help you mine the data to try to understand what was going on. And then if that weren't enough, we had Y2K come along, so we did it all one extra time, right? <laughs> And that led to a sort of a collective, you know, sort of feasting that was then followed by a prolonged belch called the tech bubble bursting. And when the tech bubble burst, kind of, we kind of dissipated all of that and we kind of came back to the, to the table, it was a new world. It was a new world because in a very large sense, the systems of record were done. Now, they're never done. But it was like the interstate highway system, which was the, one of the great national initiatives of my grandparents and my parents' generation. It's done. We, we maintain the, inter, the interstate highway system, but nobody's like, we're in the interstate highway system business. That's, I mean, that's, that's, not, that's not where the focus of investment is and hasn't been for decades. I would make the claim that that's where we are with systems of engagement. That's why it's consolidating. That's why you have SAP and Oracle as the two major players, because we're kind of done. And, and, and what the, this last decade has been in the enterprise, because there has been investment and there has been returns, it's been largely on economizing against that footprint. Virtualization, the whole VMware extended model was, was, has been dramatically impactful in this decade, but that's a, a, an optimization uh, uh, play to just to, to extract uh, unused resources from the system. So enterprise IT, I would submit to you for the last decade, has largely been on hold, but meanwhile, consumer IT it's been on fire, right? I mean, this, you know, we, we, our industry does not lack for superlatives or, or, or superlative comparisons, but honest to God, this, this is as transformative as anything imaginable in human history. And, and I think it's fair to call it the digitization of all human culture. Not just books, not just movies, not just music, not just, you know, personal communications with each other, 
that we've digitized financial services, we're digitizing healthcare services, we're digitizing educational services, we're digitizing crime, we're digitizing warfare. I mean, it, we are, we're, it used to be you said, well, I have a digital life and an analog life or a, you don't. You now ha are leading a digitally mediated life period. And you cannot negotiate life in this current century without digital mediation. So if you think about what happened, I mean, that was not true 15 years ago. So you say, well, what are the pillars of that change? And there are three of them. The first one was the internet and the, and the web and this unbelievable experience of access where all of a sudden literally anything can be answered via Google or this new thing, I think it's called Bing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, so, and even and even occasionally a Yahoo search thrown in on the side. Okay, so so but the point is, and this access isn't just for us. I mean, this access is touching the planet. This access is is causing regimes to totter and potentially topple in the Middle East, and, it, and it's creating you know waves of, of of shock throughout every every economy and every culture in the world. So it's it's just it's huge. And it's, it, it is deeply and, dem and inherently democratic in a way that is, that is just uh, highly, highly disruptive to totalitarian regimes of any kind. Then we added broadband. What broadband does is it takes it from being a medium for the mind and makes it a medium for the heart and the soul. So what, what social networking is all about is not about information, it's about pictures, either moving or not some of which you would like to endorse, some of which you would like not to endorse. But they're there and they're there now forever. And the point is they have, th this has become an emotional medium, which means it can galvanize people. When you see pictures on the internet of the Japanese earthquake or, or the nuclear thing or the rise in Tiananmen Square or the, in, in, in Egypt or Libya or all this stuff, it's deeply emotional, which means the planet is now resonating much faster than it could ever before. And then the third thing is it's mobile which means it's omnipresent, as our friends at Galleon Trading are discovering right now. I mean, you, 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 there is no privacy. I know we had a little thing about privacy. There isn't any privacy. It, it, it just isn't, it's not there. You can do whatever you wanna do, but you can't control the guy with a cell phone pointing it at you, right? So, so, so it's, a, it's a completely different world. It has been transformative, and in this world, you say, wow, I'm a powerful person in this world. I can order reservations, I can go, I can get hotels, I can get planes, I can find out anything, I can find out where my third grade, you know, classmate, you know, is today, that kind of stuff. I just, it's just when I come, and come to work, I can't figure out who's my best customer, right? So why am I so powerful as a consumer and so lame as an employee? has become the lament of the decade. And, 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 you know, and, and if you're in IT, you know why, you know why. This is hard. This is really hard to do in an enterprise. But from a user's point of view, it's like this is just brain dead. What's the matter with you people, right? So, so, so you have this, and this, by the way, always happens to IT. Right? I mean, it did with the PC, it did, it, did, it did with everything, right? Can you imagine allowing people at work to go onto the web? Well, that might waste time, right? <laughs> But, the, but people were saying that, what, eight years ago? Yeah, it was illegal to go on the web, right? Nobody would ever do a credit card transaction over the web. Never happened, right? So, okay, so we got there. So the question really is, why would it, and this is disruptive innovation in spades, right? This is what, so you say, okay, well, what would cause it to fold? Because just because it's new and it's cool doesn't mean that enterprise IT has to respond. They're very good at ignoring things for you know, prolonged periods of time and explaining to you why you're wrong. Uh, and, and by the way, they're not, they're not stupid explanations, but, they, but they're, they are tiresome. But you say, okay, what is gonna actually drive this? And this is important from an investor point of view. Jeremy and I are talking at, at, uh, at the table here because he and I, neither of us are general partners in an investment firm because we're both way too optimistic. Our view is as soon as something good shows up, everybody will love it, right? Well, they don't, they don't. So the question is what will, peop what will force people to make the move? So I've had a, the privilege in this last decade to go to this World Economic Forum thing in Davos about seven or eight times. And one of the good things about that is a, you, kind of, you kind of get a planetary view of the world economy. It's just, it's like, it's very, you're high in the mountains, you're drinking very nice wine, you get very philosophical, right? 
This is this, the Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann, set in Davos, by the way. OK, so that's, that's what it's like. So you start to step back and say, what's going on? And the big thing, it started with outsourcing. And the internet enabled outsourcing about 20 years ago. And it was this, it was this way of just getting kind of low cost, cap, you know, lowering the cost of, of, of a very high cost footprint in the manufacturing industry, and then in the customer services uh, to India. And outsourcing, however, was shockingly successful. It was so successful that we now have China as the world's second largest economy, and India is not far behind. Now, for somebody raised in my generation, that was like, that was like the falling of the Berlin Wall. Those are two things that were fundamentally unimaginable in the, in, in, the, in the generation that I was raised in. So globalization has been the most effective form of foreign aid in the history of the planet by far. You know, God bless Mr. Marshall in Europe, but not even close, right? Transform the, the, these economies and create major markets, all to the good. I mean, very tough for us, very good for them, right? The tough for us is, not only are jobs coming out, but very, very cheap goods are coming in. So now all of a sudden you have category after category after category that's getting commoditized. And you're a playing in a developed economy, you, you don't have the low cost advantage. How in the world, you, you have to have, a, you have a margin model, and these folks are eating at, at your margin model and, and, and causing it to shrink. Well, the one thing you learn if you've been in consulting for 20 years as I have, and you consult the businesses, the one thing you must never change is your margin model. You can change anything else, including the CEO with you know, monotonous regularity, but you must not cha change your margin model because it's very, very hard to reconstruct the company around a new model. So if you're going to preserve the model and commoditization's happening, what do you do? And the answer is, we have to differentiate. This is what all this stuff was about innovation. This is why there was a book about innovation, how great companies innovate at every stage of their growth. Because people are desperate to, f I need to reignite the growth engine, I need to reignite the margin model so that I can stay in business in a developed economy paying wages and having nice lunches in nice places like this. Okay, well how do you differentiate though? Because other guys are trying to do it too. And what you end up doing is you say, you know what? We can't do everything anymore. We have to specialize. We have to, we have to figure out what's our core, what's, what we're really good at. We're gonna double down there and we'll find ways to partner or otherwise economize on the other stuff. But the problem with economizing is you don't invest enough and after a while you realize, you know what? It would be better to let another company do this for whom that work is core because they will invest in the systems and in the training and in the people, which we won't. And, and then we can spend more of our time on the stuff that's core for us. So now that starts another round of outsourcing. So this is now becoming either a virtuous or a vicious circle depending on how you're feeling today, right? And how optimistic or pessimistic you feel about this, but it is certainly Darwinian. This is now the selective pressure that is driving um, uh, uh, corporations in developed economies like ours to innovate. And IT systems are one of the few places where we still have a substantial advantage over anybody in a developing economy. So how would you apply IT systems and IT power to the problem of staying ahead in this rat race. That, that, that's the global Davo, the sort of Davosian view of what's going on. So if you sort of drive it down to, okay, well, could we come back to like Earth, planet, Washington, here we are, Seattle, Redmond, here we are. The, 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 what's happened with this specialization intensification is we have a new, a new model. It, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an inherently business network oriented world. And it's now business networks competing against other business networks. You, you see this most obviously in things like Apple and AT&T versus you know, Google and Verizon versus whatever, you know, whatever, that kind of thing. You can see it, in, you see it with healthcare networks. You can see it with financial services networks. But don't kid ourselves, this is the new model because nobody can afford to be vertically integrated end to end. So in the old model, you know, hierarchically organized integrated enterprises, and they were kind of the great oaks under which they dropped acorns, and that there was sort of a, 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 an industrial policy metaphor that said if you could you know, live near an oak, you could capture acorns and start the next generation of businesses. That's not what's going on. So what's going on, the new one, is business networks of specialized enterprises. Well, how do you apply, and by the way, systems of record were designed for hierarchically organized integrated enterprises. And by the way, you need them for the other one, but they weren't designed for the other one. They're the kind of like background, not foreground. 
Business networks have a different set of IT needs, or a, not a different, a supplementary set of IT needs around communication, coordination, collaboration, because all of a sudden, these, this stuff doesn't report to you anymore, right? But, it, but you can't screw it up, right? I mean, your customer expects this to be high quality, and even if you're not manufacturing it, you're accountable for any manufacturing glitches. Same thing with customer service, same thing with finance, same thing with sales behavior, same thing with delivery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of a sudden, now if you're gonna make the network work, you have to have add a layer of sort of troubleshooting and cajoling and negotiating across the entire value chain. Essentially, everything is negotiable at this point. Because who's gonna get the allocation advantage if there's a shortage? There's gonna be a shortage of memory chips because of what's happened in Japan. Who's gonna get the memory chips, right? That's gonna be negotiated across the value chain. Who's gonna do that? The CEO? No chance. The transaction worker running SAP? No chance, okay? Somebody between the two, okay? So this is this challenge of people in the middle of our organizations are gonna engage with their peers globally to solve problems. This is the new work. This is the future of work I'm gonna talk about in a minute. When you have these negotiations, you need to have systems of record available to you because they provide a fact base from which the negotiation or the dialogue begins, but they do not supply answers. This is not a transactional form of work. This is an interactional form of work, and it requires trust, and it requires intelligence, and it requires adaptation in real time with authority. Okay, so it requires empowerment to, to do this sort of thing. So it's a pretty interesting form of work, but it needs help. We, we, how, the question is, how could you be more powerful? How could we use IT to be more powerful doing this kind of work? Which is how we're gonna get back to this consumerization thing in a minute, because remember, we're really powerful as consumers, not so powerful here. here here's, here's what's going on. Collaboration burden falls on the middle of the organization. Traditionally, the underserved middle, right? Our IT system served the frontline transaction workers and made them more productive and more automated, and maybe redundant. Um, we, they also served the top executives, particularly with the business intelligence stuff. That's not, neither of those constituencies are the constituency on the playing field right now. The playing field is the middle manager, except the middle used to be defined vertically as sort of cogs in a machine that took orders from the top and transmitted them to workers at the bottom and took data from the bottom and transmitted it up to give information to the top. If you take that machine and turn it on its side, which is what's going on, now all of a sudden they are the brokers of agreement across a set of peered entities, no one of which reports to, to, to any of the others. Now there are contractual relationships, there are customer relationships, of course there are, but they are all mediated and, and, and ongoing and, and negotiated by middle management. So the big opportunity I would claim in this decade and the next decade, I think it'll be two decades, is to fund the IT investment for the middle tier. And by the way, this middle tier is another structural advantage of the developed economies. We have middle management in this country. We have middle management in Europe. There's middle management in Japan. There is no middle management in China, and there is dysfunctional middle management in India. And that will last for decades. Dec I mean, that, that'll, it'll take them to the middle of the century, I bet. It'll take one complete sort of reboot of the generation to change that. So we have decade or more, probably two decades I would say, of competitive advantage if we can empower our middle to be more effective than their middle. And, that, and that's sort of the game of, of IT for the middle tier. So they still need systems uh, of record, but the systems of engagement, that's what we're calling these new consumerized systems. And what we mean by those are these communication, coordination, collaboration systems, which have these four characteristics that the consumer space taught us are mandatory for an information system in, in this new context and that are completely missing from enterprise IT information systems today. So if, now SAP and Oracle are migrating toward here, but if you just kind of took the last rev of, of either one of those companies' information IT sort of all-you-can-eat buffets, they, they, have very, they have a tiny bit of mobile and it just kind of sucks. They have virtually no social, they're not ad hoc, and they're not real time in the sense that we're talking about right here. They certainly, they're, they're real time transaction systems, but not 
not interaction systems. So this is a big deal. This is, there's a lot of investment that has to come from the industry. This is gonna create a whole new stack that people are gonna worry about. Much more mobile, much more social, the social content management. There's gonna be a whole security, a whole bunch of stuff is gonna change, it's gonna change there. But, but, just, it, 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 it's, but it's just work. I mean, there, there's no, this is not, this doesn't require massive invention because what we're gonna do is we are gonna piggyback on all the stuff that the consumer digital revolution showed us how to do. And what's important about these engage, systems of engagement is the word enterprise at the beginning of them. Because you would say, well, we have Facebook, we have YouTube, we have, why do we have to do it again? And the answer is because it's not suitable for the enterprise. And, and if you're gonna be, if it, the, the word enterprise carries with it an enormous amount of responsibility and accountability, and that's not the business model of, of these companies. Nor is it, and, they ha, and you say, well, why, but can't they start another division to do this? And the answer is yes, it's legal. So, and in fact, most have such a division. But it is, it's like a vestigial organ. It's like a little tiny, tiny, tiny limb, and then there's Popeye on the other side, right? So it, 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 it never will get the resource commitment necessary to make it work. So this has to be done by the enterprise systems vendors, either the existing ones, and I think there's a huge advantage to being an incumbent here if you can adapt. Uh, so I think this is Microsoft's game to play, 100%. The problem is, is as, as you know, the new book title says, free your company's future from the pole of the past. It's very, very hard to free yourself from the pole of the past, okay? So that's hard. But that doesn't mean the opportunity doesn't exist. And as you look at these callouts, you can start seeing how this turns into ROI very, very quickly. I mean, this is, this is, really, this is really powerful stuff for a middle person negotiating a supply chain or a delivery chain issue or a co-innovation issue with a, with a customer or at a, 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 a any level, okay? Or even just negotiating across your own company when you have an R&D thing in you know, Shanghai and, and you have another one in Silicon Valley and you've got an ad agency in Manhattan and you know, a customer service center in Prague, right? So just, just even inside a single corporation, this stuff can be, can be really important. And none of it exists. Order of magnitude, a little, a little Irish uh, you know, uh, exaggeration there, but, but fundamentally none of this exists. This, people can't do this today. This is, why, this is why they're saying, why am I so lame uh, as an employee? But they could, and I would submit to you that, that they will, and, and that this is gonna be a big investment. And where it's gonna focus is not on, oh God, we've got another generation of workers. They're really slackers, but they have to watch YouTube, so give them YouTube so we can employ them, right? There's old people that think like that. Sometimes I channel them myself, right? <laughs> Sometimes I'm channeling my father, my grandfather too. It's wonderful, a lot of voices in here, right? Okay, so, but the point, is, the point is that's not why you would do this. You would not do this in order to be hip or current or you know, get with it or whatever. You would do this to change your competitive footprint. And the idea here is if IT is gonna matter, because there was a big thing that Nick Carr did about 10 years saying IT doesn't matter. So I wanna say IT is, has to matter, but his challenge was fair, because he was talking about systems of record, and he said, look, systems of record are kind of done. So I'm saying, okay, but not systems of engagement, but here's how it would work. Why would my company, your company, invest in systems of engagement? Well, the first thing you'd say is, is the first claim I would make to you is your strategy, my strategy, Microsoft's strategy, is, comes to fruition and either wins or loses in a relatively small number of types of moments of engagement. If you're, if you're, if you're selling, if, you're, if you work for Goldman Sachs, these moments of engagement are when you're meeting with a potential IPO CEO. And based on that meeting, the, the, his or her trust in you goes up or it goes down. And, and by the way, that's exactly what happens. And, and it's hugely consequential. So figure out the moment of engagement. In, in the case of, of, of Amazon, it's you it, hovering your mouse over a place on, on one, of their, one of their pages. So that's their moment of engagement. It can happen in a system, it can happen with people, it can, it can happen in a lab, it can be a, an adoption moment of engagement. Did they adopt? The first time that a human being stroked their hand over a, an iPhone, you know, was like, whoa, what a moment of engagement, right? That was, Steve's the best in the world at that kind of stuff, okay? So th th those are moments of engagement. What are yours? His, that was a design moment. By the way, on the iPhone, it doesn't say manufactured in Cupertino or manufactured in China, which it is, it says designed in Cupertino, because that's his moment of engagement. Who represents you in these moments of engagement? 
What, what, what's the job title of the middle person in the middle of your firm, not CEO, not frontline worker, who represents you in these moments of engagement? And what have you done to empower those people specifically? And then what systems of engagement would make them even more powerful? And how quickly can you get them into their hands? I think that dialogue creates an opportunity for IT people and line of business people to talk to each other in a way that works. Mostly the IT line of business dialogue is kind of like the abominable snowman. It's, it's rumored to exist, but it doesn't actually ever have been cited, right? And, and this is like, no, we've got to have this dialogue. We really do have to have this dialogue, and it's an important one to have. So systems of engagement are not for placating the millennials. They are a Darwinian response to the future of work. That's the claim. So I thought I'd just close this with three last slides, um, sort of peering into what the future of work might look like. And I'd like to step back from the point of view of talking about the IT industry, which is where I live and it's my passion, it's what I do for a living, and sort of think about it you know, more in the citizen, okay, we are a citizen of the state of Washington, or I'm in the state of California, uh, but I was born in Oregon, so obviously I'm sort of a citizen of the world. Uh, <laughs> rain looks good to me. So, so I want to talk, about, just think about what would we be doing, how would we be investing in our community, and particularly what brought us together today in this room, the Innovation Summit here, how do we create economic well-being in a world that's kind of teetering in, a, in kind of funky ways? And we're kind of, it's not as obvious how to do that as it might have seemed like 10, 10 years ago. So I want to, the, the first of the three slides is called The Future of Work, and it's the virtualization of the work. And this is actually a weird thing for politicians because I want to tax, there's a tax base implied here somewhere, and I'd like to make sure that that tax base somehow gets into my coffers. So the virtualization of work can be very anxiety producing, but we just have to look at it. So what's happened is this vertically integrated corporation to horizontally collaborative value chains, that's kind of, that's kind of a given, that's what I was talking about. You have to have systems of record for the backbone, systems of engagement to empower the participants. That's sort of like, okay, that was the last 10 slides. From the physical layer to the informational layer. So all of the value creation steps not all of them, but at the margin, the, the growth valuation of value creation steps are all at the information layer, which means that information about oil is more valuable than oil. Okay? Information about a shipment is more valuable than the shipment because you can trade on that information, you can use that information, you can modify the direction where that shipment goes. We are, this is this whole idea of being knowledge workers in, 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 in an information society. But it means, therefore, that, that work is no longer hardwired to location. Because the information's everywhere, that means the work can be everywhere. Okay? The work has become portable in space and time. And we're seeing that with our workers. You kind of get that message, hey, why are you going to the office? Why don't you work at home? Why don't you work on a plane now that you have Wi-Fi on a plane so that you can't relax there either, right? <laughs> okay, I mean, so, so, but the point is it's become, it's become pervasive and nobody thinks of, I mean, when I say going, work has become like a modality, not a place, right? I am working means I'm, I've entered the cone of silence and Marie looks over at me and says, oh yes, he's working, I can tell because he's not responding to anything I say to him. Okay, <laughs> so he must be working. I hope to God I am. Right? Uh, but so, 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 so that's, you kind of get that. But look at the implications then for career paths, for management structure, for authority, for accountability, because all, this whole structure, command and control structure, where you get promoted to become a vice president at some point, maybe a president at some point, eh, I mean, yes, it sort of has to exist, and, and, and particularly for Sarbanes-Oxley, we have to put somebody in jail. So, so okay, CEO is a good, good candidate. But the point is, is that much more the contract with, with the, the the contract of work has gone from I show up and do what you tell me to do, which was kind of the old contract. And by the way, you will take care of me for most of my adult life. Vert to now, it's like I have a set of deliverables, and you shouldn't care how I get them done, other than if I don't break the law, and I get them done on time. Okay? So it's a complete, and my kids have grown up completely with that social contract. None of them imagine themselves as an employee. Okay? They, they imagine themselves as companies of one who might take on as a client a single customer, e.g. an employer. <laughs> but, but they have no vision that that employer has any paternalistic social contract. They have no sense of social contract with that employer in either direction. Okay? And they think social security is something that probably they will never get. Okay, so they don't think they have a social contract with the government either. They really do see themselves in this sort of highly contractual way. So all of a sudden, if we're creating work in this new world, the notion of big institutions or even small businesses, we've gotta be thinking it's virtualized work. The work is gonna be carried in our heads and in our devices 
much more than in the place of work and, and, and where we are, which has big implications if you're trying to create success for a community, a community where we can raise children, where we can you know, you know, ha lead lives, et cetera. So now, so that's like, wow. So if that's true, what happens to the enterprise? Because the world still wants large enterprises. The world w likes big companies like IBM and Cisco and Microsoft and, and, and uh, you know, Oracle and all these companies because they can reach across the globe and they can be accountable for very, very big investment pools and they can do lots and lots of good things. But how do you architect those companies going forward? And historically, we architected them nationally. So General Electric was a US company. General Electric's not a US company. N no large corporation anymore is a, any, it, it belongs to a country. And that's why the, the, the stock market can do so well even when countries do so badly. Because the, 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 the corporation is floating free from the national boundary. So now, now we have the public policy thing of well, what does that mean? What does that mean? So we're organizing, when we start organizing the enterprise and we're thinking about how we're gonna organize and it gets back to IT as well, you wanna organize around value creation and risk mitigation. Those are the two principles that you keep coming back to, you say no matter what happens, my enterprise to be successful has to manage value and it has to manage risk. And we use this phrase called core versus context for value, which is core is that differentiating, specializing thing that I do brilliantly, and context is everything else, okay? And, and, and the issue on risk is just how, how, how mission critical it is. So on the core context side, if you think about the value creation side, the idea is you wanna re-architect your enterprise so that most of the people and most of the money is going to things that are core to you, that are your specialty, which means more and more of the non-specialized work you've gotta shove outside the boundaries of the enterprise. Very scary idea. If you, nuclear power example in Japan, case in point number one. How do you do that? But the problem is you have to do it. You have to do it because you can't afford to carry the burden of all the non-specialized stuff that has to get done. So this notion of becoming boundaries, and these boundaries have to be semi-permeable. You've gotta be able to see outside but kind of keep some of the non-differentiating stuff out and the differentiating stuff in, and then to make it even worse, your competitor, anything you do that's unique to you, they start copying it. So after four or five or six or seven years, guess what, it's not core anymore because everybody does it. And now you've got to say, damn, now that's got to get outside the company, right? And I've got to find yet another thing that will be new. Okay. So, so you see how easy it is to get trapped in your own past? Because at some point you say, I'm tired. I hate this stuff. Stop. And, and the world says, sorry. No, this, this. spin, spin, spin. Does not stop. Right? And, and, and so this notion of, of, of how do I continually respond to that? And this is why companies at some point go out of existence, because they just get tired. They just say, you know what? I'm tired. I'm just gonna hang on as long as I can, then you know, we'll be, we'll be you know, DEC, we'll be Lucent, we'll be Sun, we'll be AT&T. You know, those were the, some of the very, very best companies of, 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 my, of that generation. So it's easy to get tired, right? But you have to have this adaptive architecture thing. Which means the other thing you've gotta be doing at the same time is I gotta get this out of my company, but I can't just ignore it. I can't have like Mattel toys made in China Poisoning children, right? Or milk formula, or drug formula, or, or whatever the heck it is, right? So all of a sudden now, again, look at the, look at the importance of information systems on, the, on this slide. Information systems provide the leverage to attack both these problems. They don't solve them, but they attack them. And they give you the opportunity to get ahead of them and stay ahead of them, but they continually require you to, to invest. And so that gets me to the, to the last slide of these things, which is, so we live in, in this case, Seattle, Washington. What are we supposed, what does this have to do with us, or more importantly, how can we make our location powerful in this new world of work, in this new future of work? How, we, we're, you, you've invested your time to be here today, this is something you clearly care about, it's just not obvious, what, am I do? what do I do? And, I, and I'm just gonna try to fill up one slide, but believe me, this is, these are very preliminary ideas, but I think this is the kind of thinking that we're gonna start doing more and more of. So the first thing is, there's the demand side. Um, all of my adult life, this has been the market you had to play in. The US market was the market, everybody had to come to us, we played home games, and then we played away games when we wanted to. All right, no, not in this century. 
All the great growth markets will be outside of the developed economies. We're going to add 90 million people in the developed economies and 300 million in the developing economies. And I can't remember what year that's going to be, but that's the ratio, one to four. So we have to play away games. And that's not, we've always played home games, right? So that's, that, means, that means such things as, you know, there's a wonderful John, John Cleese remark. He says, you know, if England hosted an event called the World Series, they would invite other countries. <laughs> we as Americans, that, that's a kind of a wake-up call for our culture, right? We really do have to embrace the fact that there's a world and that it's not about us. You know, it's not, they're not that into you, right? <laughs> But I think we have massive business culture advantages. One of the things you learn, again, if you, if you do business outside the United States is that this is such a innovation-friendly culture. You just can't, you can't imagine, even in the most staid, you know, bureaucratic company in this country, country, uh, company in this country it's wildly different than, than in being in any other country in the world. You just, you, the, the, the permission to stretch the envelope if you act ethically if you learn from failure, if you can move ahead, it's just totally different here than it is anywhere else in the world. It's a huge advantage. Because of this adaptive thing, we play adaptive better than anybody by far, unless we get righteous. Periodically, we have these bouts of righteousness where we, right, those are moments of failure. But, 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 but when you can get over them and get back in, we get back into the game faster than anybody. And so that's a big deal. So, that, so we have to learn to play away games, and I think we ought to be able to do that. The second thing is, on our own home turf, we have to take up our game a lot. So this is an idea that we started playing with with Davos for developing economies about five or six years ago, but I think it's actually now about us, which is this notion, Michael Porter had this idea about 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. He wrote a book called The Competitive Advantage of Nations. And he said, you know, you want to have these global centers of excellence where the world looks to that place and says, Man, that's where you go for that. You go to Hollywood for movies, you go to Detroit for cars, you go for New York for financial services. Now, in my whole adult life, that was true of the world. Today, the Deutsch, I mean, the European stock exchange is buying the New York stock exchange. That doesn't sound like New York is the center of financial services to me. Uh, Detroit is the center of the global automobile market. Feels a little bit like a stretch, right? Uh, Hollywood, maybe. Bollywood, maybe. I mean, who knows? The point is, we're seeing centers of excellence show up uh, around the world, and that's that's actually a good thing for the world. But it says to us, we have to step step ours back up. So, what would it mean to develop a global center of excellence from a public policy point of view? That's a dialogue that we haven't had yet because it's a core context dialogue about the state of Washington. What, is core, what, what should Washington be world famous for? 40 years ago in Silicon Valley, it wasn't called, it was the San Jose Valley, it was world famous for fruit. It was the world famous agricultural fruit place. Okay? So it became famous for what it's become famous for. Nobody else in the world will become famous for what Silicon Valley became famous for because you don't need two of them. Right? You need, each global center of excellence has got to be unique and, and, and precious to the world. So what is close to being unique and precious here? And what ecosystem can we put in place here and, 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 and incubate and vitalize? And then, by the way, all the other business is great, but it's not our core. It's not our core. So how do we play that? And that, because you can imagine the political dialogue. That, that'll engender. Who's calling who context around here, dude? You know, I'm a voter, right? And, and it's, it's a hard dialogue to have. But the point is, it does, these ecosystems create massive wealth. And they create, and, and that massive wealth funds all the other businesses in that ecosystem. So it's not like the other businesses aren't important or aren't part of the community or blah, 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 but they aren't the, thing, they aren't the community's claim to fame. They aren't the thing that attracts global investment into that community the way the manufacturing you know, at, at, at Shanghai and Shenzhen and those things have created, the way the, 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 the computer IT services at Bangalore have created a global center of excellence there. The design capabilities in Milan and in Tokyo have created you know, global centers of excellence there. What's our global center of excellence uh, here? right? And, and what does that mean for education and immigration in particular? Those are two things I care a ton about. Um, for education, you know, the, the issue is this adaptive thing, and then it should specialize. You need universities who excel in the thing that your community is going to make core. So you can't just say, that's what people used to come in, but like for years, people said, we want to be more like Silicon Valley. Well, great, just get a Stanford and a Berkeley in the same place, you'll be fine. 
Right, well, we don't have one of those. Oh, well, sorry. I mean, the point is, the, the, every one of these has a very distinct pedigree. Okay, and, uh, and so that's that. Okay, and then immigration, the t you need to get the talent there too. So final thoughts, future of enterprise of IT is changing the future of work. I don't think I could have been saying these things about virtualization and re-architecting the enterprise and location if it weren't for the impact of the IT and, and the uh, and internet, and et cetera, et cetera. Conversely, I think the future of work is gonna change the future of enterprise IT, because I think we're gonna to have to take our game up a level, which means the transaction systems alone will not cut it, which means I think there's another trillion dollars to spend on the next layer of IT to enable developed economies to be effective. And then the future of Washington, I think being a global, I think you guys are a natural to be a global center of excellence for enterprise IT of this next generation. Uh, I, I don't think it's Silicon Valley. I don't think it's, I, I just don't, I don't know where else it would be because I think Microsoft is as close to the center of, of gravity for where you would do this as anything. And it's a hell of an institution and it happens to be where we are today. So with that, I want to say thank you very much. I'm going to turn this back over to uh, Susanna and team. Thanks a lot. Appreciate having a chance to talk to you.